Come with me for a quick visit to Cleve Abbey in Somerset. I spent about three hours here, there's so much to see, but don't worry, the video is only 15 minutes long. To get to the Abbey, you first have to pass over the Washford River. Monasteries were usually built close to running water, the water useful both for the sanitation and for industry. The first thing you are faced with as you pass over the river is the great 13th century gatehouse of the Abbey Precinct. The Abbey Precinct of 28 acres was enclosed around with walls and in places by moats, not to keep people out, to, but to demark this space as one that was set aside for prayer and for hospitality. The Abbey was a Cistercian Abbey. In the 11th century, the Benedictine order was getting a little lax and decadent, and the Cistercian order was founded in France in the late 11th and early 12th century by a group of monks, including Bernard of Clairvaux, who wanted to follow the rule of St Benedict to the letter and with simplicity. The Abbey at Cleve was founded by a colonising group of Cistercian monks from Reevesby in Lincolnshire, right at the other end of the country. They arrived here in 1198. They named their monastery Vallis Florida, the Flowering Valley. It only later became known as Cleve. Often when you visit a medieval monastery, all that is left are unroofed ruins, but at Cleve much survives. The portion of the abbey that remains intact are the domestic buildings, the monks' living quarters. They survive as at the dissolution of the monasteries and the reign of Henry VIII they were converted into a house. The portion of the abbey I'm showing you now is the central square courtyard called the Cloister, shown in this plan in red which was a central connecting hub of the late medieval monastery, connecting all the buildings together and connecting the domestic space of the abbey to the church. The cloister originally had covered and glazed walkways around it, and parts of the late medieval west walk and its windows still survive. As I pan round now from the north, coming into view is the eastern domestic range of the abbey. The ground floor of this range is shown in red on this plan, and it contained a series of rooms for different purposes. The first doorway on the left is the library, where the abbey's books were kept. The large door with two windows flanking it is the chapter house, we'll come to see that in a moment. Next to this is the day stairs, that was used by the monks to access the dormitory which is on the first floor above all these rooms. And next to this is the tiny parlour, where the monks could engage in conversation. Then beyond that is a slip or passageway that once led to the infirmary, the hospital block, and off this is the warming house, the only place that the monks could keep themselves warm by a fireside. So let's go and have a look at the chapter house, which aside from the church was the most important building in a medieval abbey. And as we do, we pass the slip, which now leads to the site of the long lost infirmary, notice the door to the warming room, and we bypass the parlour and the day stairs to the dormitory. Here we are at the chapter house. This was the place that the monks, presided over by the abbot, gathered daily to see to the administrative affairs of the abbey and to administer internal justice. It is called the chapter house as here a daily portion of the rule of St Benedict would be read to reinforce the purpose of the community's common life. The chapter house was the usual burial place of abbots in the 13th and 14th century and they were often buried so that the feet of their successor might rest on them during chapter meetings. It was always an impressive space to reflect the importance of this building and Cleve's chapter house was built in the early 13th century not long after the abbey was founded and was vaulted throughout in stone and the walls plastered and decorated with foam masonry lines and the vault painted too some parts of that decoration still remains. It would originally have been a very impressive space. Leaving the chapter house we turn immediately left and we go up the day stair which led to the first floor and to the largest space other than the church in the abbey, the abbey dormitory where the monks slept. There was a second stair uh, to the dormitory, the night stair, which led down directly into the abbey church so that during night services the monks could go directly into the abbey choir. Just think that these stairs have been in continual use for 800 years. You emerge at the top of them into an astonishing space, a, a massive room, a, a dormitory that was built to sleep a community of a little under 40 who would originally have slept communally in this open space. 
the end of the dormitory was a doorway on the left that led through to the latrines. When a monk needed the toilet, he would come up here to the dormitory and to these communal latrines. In the later Middle Ages, the dormitory was subdivided with timber partitions into individual cells for the monks. The present roof of the dormitory is not the original, but dates from the 17th century when the space was used as a barn and the cloister was then a farmyard. Having explored the 13th century East Range, let's go back down now into the cloister and go and have a look at the South Range of buildings. The 13th century South Range at Cleve was demolished in the late 15th century and a new, grander set of rooms constructed in their place, primarily to accommodate the changing needs of the monastic community. The ground floor of the South Range was developed to provide a series of very smart chambers with their own fireplaces and chimneys. We know that by the end of the 15th century the number of monks here was declining and there were at times financial difficulties. One of the ways monasteries of Cleve size kept the wool from the door in this period was to accommodate within them lay pensioners called Corodians who paid a lump sum in cash to retire to a monastery and receive bed and board from the monks. And these ground floor chambers in the South Range may well be to accommodate them. Back into the cloister and a little to the west is another set of stairs that leads up to the first floor of the South Range. These grand and impressive stairs terminate in a well-lit 15th century landing with the door in the west that led through into what was the abbot's lodging more of that in a minute, and one in the east that leads to the 15th century refectory, where, in theory at least, the monks ate their meals communally. The refectory at Cleve is another impressive space. After the dissolution of the monasteries, it was turned into the hall of the mansion uh, that the abbey was turned into. Later, it was used as farm storage. At the east end of the room can still be seen the raised dais on which the abbot's table would have been placed and where he ate. And until the 19th century, there were the remains of a massive late medieval crucifix painted on the walls behind it. The fireplace in the refectory isn't original, but is a post-Reformation addition and replaces the pulpit. During meals, the monks ate in silence, while one of their fellows read a passage from a spiritual book from this raised pulpit. There is not much Cistercian simplicity on sharing Cleves refectory. By the time it was constructed, times had changed, things were laxer. The most impressive feature of the space is its glorious late medieval roof, the beams adorned with images of carved angels. The refectory and grand stairs that approach it have much in common with the halls of rich gentlemen and nobles. Abbots in the late Middle Ages were increasingly treated like great lords and were expected to live in appropriate surroundings and with an appropriate household. And this space is as much about secular display as it is about monastic necessity. The stairs and hall provide an appropriate and grand approach to the abbot's private lodgings, which were to the west. The entrance to the abbot's private lodgings is through this timber gallery, which is accessed through this door in the corner of the refectory. As you pass through the gallery, the first room you come to is now called the painted chamber. This is a door both from the stairs and from the gallery, and was probably a sort of audience chamber or place of business or counting house within the abbot's lodging. It has a really very impressive late medieval wall painting with a legend from the Gesta Romanorum, the deeds of the Romans. The rest of the abbot's house has mostly been destroyed as it was converted into a farmhouse in the 17th century and then rebuilt and later turned into a series of cottages that were still occupied in the 20th century. A glimpse of the former grandeur of the lost abbot's house can be seen on the second floor where there is an intact late 15th century chamber complete with its original roof. This might even have been the abbot's own bedchamber. It was clearly a very high status room as the walls still reveal scraps of the original painted scheme which included instruments of Christ's passion. Leaving this space I went outside and ran to the back of the South Range. Here you can see the great windows of the refectory and to the left those of the painted chamber and the upper chamber. 
The timber structure in front, which was erected in 2016, shelters something quite extraordinary. When the mid-13th century refectory was demolished in the 15th century to create the present South Range, the floor of the former refectory, which ran north-south rather than east-west, was simply covered over and not taken up. The tile floor of this earlier refectory has now been revealed, and it is a rare opportunity to see such an expanse of medieval tiles still in situ. The tiles are mostly heraldic, and they bear the coats of arms of prominent men, the royal arms of King Henry III, the double eagle on the arms of his brother Richard the King of the Romans, and the arms of the Duchy of Cornwall and those of de Clare for Richard's son Edmund, Duke of Cornwall, and his wife Margaret. The inclusion of all these arms helpfully dates the work to the mid-13th century. Henry III was a major patron of Cleve Abbey, giving to it both lands and timber for construction work, and the floor records his patronage for posterity. Emerging from the slip back into the cloister, I'm going to take you now up the East Cloister Walk and through the south door of the Great Abbey Church, the door the monks would have used during the day as they made their way to services. As you'll see, there is very little left of the church, which was mostly mid-13th century. That's thanks to Henry VIII and his dissolution of the monasteries. In 1536, an Act of Parliament was passed to dissolve all the monasteries in England with an income under £200. Cleve wasn't among the richest abbeys in the country. With an annual income of £155 a year, it fell within the bracket for dissolution. Somehow it got missed off the initial list for dissolution, and it wasn't until September 1536 that the abbey was suppressed. There was a general lamentation in the local area, as the monks were of honest life, and they were known to keep great hospitality. A fifth of the abbey's income each year was distributed to the poor and to travellers, and as well as the monks, the abbey supported 23 other people with both wages and lodgings. However, the law was the law, and on the 6th of September 1536, Abbot Doval and Sub-Prior Webb and 13 monks surrendered the abbey to the Crown Commissioners. They had to leave, some went to other monasteries, Abbot Doval received a pension of £26 a year. The church was immediately demolished so it couldn't be used again. The lead and bells melted down, the stone reused. The remaining buildings were then let to a gentleman called Anthony Bustard on a 21-year lease and he used the refectory as his great hall and the abbot's house as his lodgings. The property was eventually settled on Robert Radcliffe, Earl of Sussex, as a prize for helping suppress the Pilgrimage of Grace, a northern rebellion against the dissolution of the monasteries in 1536. He never lived there, but the property continued to be let to tenants, the abbot's house becoming in time a farmhouse, and the eastern and southern ranges farm buildings around a cloister that had become a farmyard. This new use as a farm ensured the survival of so much of the domestic spaces at Cleve. You leave Cleve Abbey in the same way you arrived, through the Great Gateway. But as you leave, there's one last thing to enjoy. The Gateway was rebuilt in the early 16th century by the last abbot Doval, and he incorporated into it a carved panel of the crucifixion and a panel with his name on it. The purpose of this was to remind all those who passed this way to pray for him perpetually. And although the world he knew has passed away and his abbey has gone, 500 years later this panel is still serving the same purpose it did in the 1530s, to remind all who pass beneath this gate that Doval once ruled here as abbot. Thanks very much for watching. If you want to learn more about Cleve Abbey, I can't recommend highly enough the new guidebook. It has been written by Dr Michael Carter, who is an expert in medieval monastic art and architecture. I'll put a link in the description box below to the English Heritage website where copies can be purchased.